Do you see slides? No. No? Sorry. Okay. Now you see slides, right? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, shoot. Actually, you are saying the... Uh, Sorry, let me actually stop sharing for this screen. Oh, yeah. All right. How about that? That looks better, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you all for being here. Again, I'm JP Walsh with uh, the University of Rhode Island. And thank you very much for the nice uh, introduction, Ahmed. Uh, just a, um, I thought I, I, I always like to start by introducing myself, but since you did such a nice job, I will just move past that. Here are some pictures from me as a young uh, youngster. And, um, you know, this is uh, after a hurricane in New Jersey where I grew up. And um, that's one of the things that we have a long history of, of coastal uh, events here that are really um, motivating for people to be uh, concerned about our coasts. Uh, I also want to just go ahead and say thank you now to Ahmed, who um, I've known for quite a while, the organizers, students, collaborators, uh, uh, and of course, all of you for being here. So um, as Ahmed mentioned, uh, I won't talk about my research today, but some of the work that I do focuses on um, what I would interpret as the coastal zone, uh, how material moves from land to the ocean as well as um, coastal dynamics, uh, how uh, storms and sea level rise are altering our coast. Uh, so today I'm speaking to you from Rhode Island. And just for those of you that aren't aware, um, Rhode Island is a very small state in the United States uh, between um, Boston and New York City. Um, and Rhode Island is quite small, although we have a lot of ocean coastline um, it's so small that people joke that it's three point, uh, excuse me, it's three percent smaller during high tide. So we actually get smaller. Um, and that sort of highlights how sensitive we are to uh, ocean dynamics. Uh, and I want to emphasize that point before I start speaking. We also are a densely populated state, and this is why um, we're very focused on issues of the ocean. Um, and the first site of the offshore wind uh, in the United States. University of Rhode Island also has many great strengths in marine science and policy. I'm not going to read all this, this slide, but um, I want to highlight that we're doing quite a lot of work in uh, ocean science. And um, I'm very fortunate to be uh, working on this very nice campus uh, that Ahmed visited last year um, to do to study the ocean. Uh, and, and the coastal changes. Also, um, it's worth m mentioning as I begin is that I am director of what's called the Coastal Resources Center. And we are a very unique center, uh, sort of somewhat like a, an NGO or a non-government organization that is focused on uh, working with communities and the public to bring them information about the coasts to bring uh, them together to discuss concerns and problems. Um, and we do this uh, around the globe. Uh, uh, we've had a number of projects, of course, a lot in the United States, but also um, much uh, internationally. Um, and we uh, really take this approach of working with people um, because we've learned that management is not only about telling people what's to, what what needs to be done. It's also about uh, learning um, the best way to set policy and um, to use science to guide those approaches. So that is something, an important message that I'm going to be highlighting throughout my presentation today. Uh, the Coastal Resources Center is working, as I mentioned, on um, around the world, but on many different aspects of, of our coast. So uh, coastal resilience with storms and sea level rise, aquaculture, uh, and, and of course, many other um, aspects internationally. So um, I just wanted to highlight that when we talk about coastal management, 
Uh, we're, we're not only thinking about one topic. Uh, we're, we're usually thinking about um, a range of topics that are related to the interests of the people of a certain place. Uh, so it's very much about a, uh, a certain um, place where you have a population and their pressing concerns um, or uh, maybe scientific guidance on those concerns. All right, so um, I, I also wanted to begin with an example of coastal management to, to provide you with some understanding of how we use it um, in, in the United States and why we use it. Um, so shown here are a couple images from North, excuse me, from Rhode Island. Uh, these are from a couple storms and they show a lot of damage. We have a coast that's at risk due to storms and sea level rise. And also it's being affected by human activity because people are building uh, structures near the coast. Um, also we have uh, important public infrastructure um, there's been quite a lot of research on understanding our coastal system. Um, over 50 years, uh, hundreds of students and faculty have focused on the problems of our coast. Um, and we've documented uh, very pronounced changes. Uh, for example, the shoreline is on average uh, eroding um, on the outer of uh, half a meter per year. While that doesn't sound like a, a, a very high rate of erosion, over 50 years, uh, that's a lot of erosion um, that puts property and people uh, in harm's way. Um, and uh, many areas of our coast are, are vulnerable to storm surge and erosion, as I will show you. So uh, I wanna present an example uh, and here's a picture from a hurricane in 1954. This is a picture of a, a, a large building. Um, it's actually part of what's called the Edgewood Yacht Club. Um, when, when it's literally surrounded by the ocean and being attacked by waves. Uh, this um, was an incredible hurricane that affected our coast uh, and uh, bringing um, a large storm surge, like almost three to almost four to five meters of storm surge, uh, caused incredible damage around our coastal system. So we, uh, yes, climate change is happening, and there are many concerns about climate change. But the reality is, our coastline here um, has been susceptible to storms for decades. Uh, we, we have been at risk for a long time and what, and we're only getting more at risk. Uh, and I will give you a demonstration of that. So again, here's the Edgewood Yacht Club. And in the next image, I'm going to show you a map. Uh, so this is part of our coastline in Rhode Island. And, uh, this is a big, uh, water body, part of an estuary. And shown here, this arrow is the location of the Edgewood Yacht Club, uh, where that image was from. And what you can see is this is a satellite image from today. And you probably can see the amount of development that is uh, covering our coastline, right? People have invested in homes, we've built roads, uh, et cetera. And what you can see is that um, there's quite a lot of development today. Uh, what I'm going to now show you is, in a, is an image of um, projected storm surge from um, a similar hurricane if it was to happen today. So this is um, a modeling of, of how uh, sea level would rise during a storm like the one that happened in 1954. And what you can see in the colors being shown is flooding depths, how deep the water would get um, uh, for, in terms of meters, uh, three feet is about um, uh, one meter. And so you can see that there's vast areas of our coastline today that would be underwater during this sort of storm event. Um, and much of that is now where we have structures of thousands of people that live. So um, this is a tool that was developed by 
uh, researchers in at the University of Rhode Island, in partnership with the state of Rhode Island, um, with the goal of managing our coast for our specific problem, which is uh, storms and sea level rise. So this is a tool that was created that anyone can use now um, to look at uh, the risk of their community or their home if they want to zoom in and look that close. So um, the state of Rhode Island, which is, a, again, a small state in the United States, is being very um, uh, focused on managing our coastline. Uh, and we do that in a very specific way. The state of Rhode Island has its own tools for management. It uses something called um, special area management plans, which are plans for portions of the coast. Um, and in order to enact a plan, um, the state brings together scientists, uh, the public, uh, other entities to um, discuss and understand uh, the problem in this area. Um, as you can, as I just showed you, um, this effort created these tools to understand the risk. And from that, um, policies have been developed. So now the state of Rhode Island has enacted a policy that is focused on um, managing uh, development on our coast to prevent future uh, or limit future hazards um, in our state. And of course, um, Science is critical to all of this discussion, um, but I wanna emphasize it's not only science. So many of us as scientists think science is the most important and it is very important, but in many ways, it's also about understanding the people and the place um, for management to be effective, uh, for people to understand the risk or the problem and to take action um, in that regard. But here's an image of some of my students doing surveying of our coastline. This is something that we've continued for uh, many decades. Um, and we do that because our coastline is continued, continuing to be attacked. This is a, a picture that I took last fall from a, a nor'easter, a type of storm hitting our coastline. And you can see the waves are at the uh, edge of, of homes um, actively uh, damaging our coastal system. And because of this problem, we really need coastal management. We need to uh, work as a state and as a community to put some of these policies in place um, to try and make us stronger today and into the future. Okay, hopefully I'm not going too fast. Is that okay so far? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, sorry, I tend to talk uh, quickly. We, we so. have we have uh, um, uh, a translator with us, so it's great also for like. Oh, okay, uh, you can hear. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I hopefully I'm not too fast for the translator. Um, <laughs> so um, some learning objectives for the the the. Uh, lesson today. Um, first, when we talk about coastal zone management, we have to consider what is the coast. Um, and I will give you a definition. But one thing I want to highlight is that um, many people interpret the coast as very different things. So um, it is important whenever you want to do some management that you define where, you know, what portion of the coast you're discussing. And I will um, uh, give an example in a second. Um, why do we need to manage the coastline? Well, I think um, that is probably obvious to for many of you, but I will you know just sort of re repeat uh, some in that regard. I'll discuss a little bit about how we manage the coast. So there are many different um, approaches to managing our coast and in, and many different entities that are managing our coast. Um, I unfortunately I'm not that familiar with uh, Egypt and and the uh, entities that are involved in coastal management there, but uh, maybe um, some of you could share uh, stories from Egypt or uh, the other countries represented there during the training. Um, 
And then also I'm going to highlight some critical approaches or frameworks to think about for coastal management. Um, coastal management has been around for decades. Um, as long as I've been alive, in really in the 1970s is when coastal zone management um, kind of expanded as an emphasis. All right, so what is the coast? So I'm sharing with you a picture of um, a place. Many of you, I'm sure, have never been there. This is uh, uh, an area known as um, Coron in the Calamianes in the Philippines. But it's not important where it is. It's a, an image, a satellite image. And what you can see is different parts of a coast. And what I want to get you to think about is that what each of you probably when you see this image, you think about the coast being different things. Some of you may sort of imagine that, that the coast is the shoreline, that it's this zone. Maybe that the, the coast in your mind is the reef. Uh, maybe it's um, some of you maybe think a little bit more about the, the, the coastal waterways and some of the boating that's occurring. Um, so, in fact, in my mind and the real some the sort of maybe some of the broadly accepted definition, this entire this image here, all of it is the coast, with the exception of some of the very high uh, latitude or excuse me, altitude areas of this island that um, maybe are technically sort of out of a, an elevation range. But really, all of this is the coast in that um, what's happening on land is connected to what's happening on uh, in the ocean. And when we think about manage it, managing the coast, we may need to take actions um, to, for example, consider coastal development, which may be affecting the coast, or um, we may need to take action on managing uh, activities at sea, for example, tourism uh, that's happening in this um, in this uh, this image. So um, very important to think about, and um, I'll get to a definition in one second. Uh, here's a, another image. This is um, Hergada, Egypt, and uh, another sort of example of what is the coast. Um, of course, many of us probably think of the coast as being this this kind of coastal shoreline, maybe some of the reefs, but really the coast extends up landward because what happens in the watershed is bringing material um, through the coastal system uh, and or through the uh, sort of shoreline area and then eventually to the sea. So when you have a very intense um, rain event, for example, uh, actually, if you look very carefully right here in this satellite image, you can see a drainage network of of sediment um, moving uh, in landwards, excuse me, seaward towards the coast. So the coast really extends all the way up into sort of the, uh, the hills and mountains and all the way to um, just sort of seaward of these islands. Uh, the Red Sea uh, drops very quickly to the deeper um, areas of the Red Sea. And so this is what we would interpret uh, the coast as really extending from probably here all the way up to uh, somewhere up here, depending on your definition. And we need to think about um, the many processes that could be affecting our coast. So the coastal zone is really a transition zone between the terrestrial or land areas and the ocean areas. Um, in the broadest definition, um, it extends from what we call the coastal plains um, which is kind of the uh, areas on land where we're draining mountains, um, all the way to the outer edge of what we call the continental shelf, which is the, um, the seaward areas um, that uh, before they drop down to the deep ocean floor. For simplicity, some of us might think of the coast as extending from 200 meters um, of elevation down to minus 200 meters of depth. Um, and this is just one definition. Of course, there's many different definitions out there of what the coast is. So I want to emphasize that point as well. Okay, so why is the coast important? Um, I'm sure you all understand uh, the value of the coast. There's uh, very um, diverse natural systems and important resources 
um, along our coastal areas. The coast represents um, only 12% of the Earth's surface, but it's so critical to our human uh, sort of resource needs as well as our cultural um, foundations. It's a major source for food. It's critical for transportation and development. Uh, it's a source for minerals and geological uh, products. Um, and of course, it's a critical place for tourism and biodiversity. So there's many reasons why the coastal system is important and why we may need to manage it. Of course, coastlines are also very dynamic, um, meaning they're changing because of uh, a variety of processes, both natural processes and human driven processes. So natural processes, we can think of uh, sea level changes and storms and seismic events, currents, waves, tides, um, the flow of water through our um, from land to sea. These are all natural things. Of course, you know, global warming is something that humans have played a role in. So that's not fully natural, maybe, but um, but nevertheless, uh, many forces. And then, of course, humans are doing all sorts of things that will affect our coasts. Uh, literally um, carving out coastal areas and depositing sediments, um, changing how water is moving uh, across the system, uh, affecting um, or you know harvesting living and non-living, and um, altering sort of nutrients and putting in pollutants. So many things. So um, I'll stop reading this list, but there's there's so many concerns um, that are related to human activities. There's also um, lots of phenomenon or different sort of uh, processes that are occurring in our coasts that we have that, that we are concerned about. Um, obviously, we've already talked about sea level and flooding, but there's also public health. Uh, many of us are are um, using and uh, maybe enjoying our coast, enjoying the seafood, but there's a risk of of contamination. Um, there's of course risk to our ecosystems in terms of how they may be damaged or um, altered by uh, some of the processes or impacts that we have. Um, and then of course, uh, we are exploiting um, our coasts in terms of fisheries and having that very direct impacts. So many different phenomena are of interest in our coasts. Um, also, I need to highlight that our coastlines are very different around the world. Um, and so I think uh, it's, it is very helpful for us um, in science and in management to look to other places around the world to um, understand how people are managing. But of course, our coastlines are different. Um, one of the primary reasons they're different is, is um, the geological evolution. Um, you know, I live here uh, and that, coastal system obviously looks very different than uh, areas around uh, the Middle East and uh, in particular in, in Egypt. Um, I'm not gonna talk about geological history uh, now, but I wanna highlight that point. Shown here is a map of the Northern Red Sea. And you could see that uh, the Red Sea is a very deep um, sort of ocean water body. The coast is is generally quite narrow because of the um, the the very recent you know sort of history of the Red Sea. Um, uh, it's also dynamic uh, and evolving. This is um, a map of earthquake uh, locations in the Red Sea, and you can see um, there's quite a number of earthquakes related to the geology um, of this place. So um, important things to consider. Um, also, the, uh, the oceans are experiencing sea level changes. Um, of course, today we hear a lot about sea level rise. Um, but in the past, sea level has gone up and down. This is a graph of, of time going back thousands of years from the present is zero and going back 800,000 years. I know that's a very long time and probably not something many of you think about, but we have a, a wealth of geological evidence that shows that sea level has gone up and down 
really significantly over a hundred meters um, over that those um, several hundred thousand years. Um, this is related to global um, warming and cooling, uh, which has created variation in ice on on land and therefore water in the ocean. Um, where I'm talking to you today at, at the University of Rhode Island, we were literally underneath uh, an ice sheet uh, 25,000 years ago. And our coast um, at that time, 25,000 years ago, was, um, was really different. It was, uh, this is our, uh, where Rhode Island is today. That was completely under ice uh, and all the way, ice extended all the way out onto our, into our ocean area. And the what we call the continental shelf was um, was land. So what is water, and where we do most of our boating and fishing today was all land uh, as early as twenty five thousand years ago. Um, I know that you know this is probably not something that's in many of your minds, but it's important to the history of our place um, uh, to understand this sort of longer term uh, sort of geological history and how that might affect today. Um, also, um, there's projections of, of really, uh, unfortunately this is blocking it, but this is a map of, of future land use of, of Rhode Island. So um, this is a project, pro, projection of what Rhode Island will look like in 2050. Um, and what it shows, I know you, all are not familiar with Rhode Island, but today there's a city of Providence and by 2050, this sort of model is projecting that we are gonna have coastal development, extensive coastal development throughout our entire coastal zone. Um, and so many of us, when we think about coastal zone management, we, we need to be thinking about the future, 10, 20, 50 years from today. Um, because there's incredible development happening in many places, and this is going to affect our, our coast and ocean. And we want to keep our um, coast and ocean functional for the many reasons I've already talked about. So we need to think about the past, um, but also need to think about the future um, as, we, as we consider coastal zone management. All right, when we think about our coast, um, many of us may have a picture of uh, dolphins or coral reefs or some very specific element of our coastal um, ocean and ecosystem. But I think, again, what I want to highlight here today is that uh, coastal zone management is about thinking of the entire ecosystem and its many components. Um, Here's a very simple, uh, you know, sort of illustration of our uh, coastal marine ecosystem. And of course, yes, we may have dolphins and we may have different types of shellfish and, and fish, um, but we also have to include our land, as I mentioned, um, how farming or um, other activities, development, may be um, releasing materials that are entering our coasts. Um, as well as changes in the atmosphere and in the sea. So there's many different ways our marine ecosystem may be altered um, by uh, um, external changes. And when we talk about our marine ecosystem, we need to think about not only the biology, which is what many people think of when they think of our coastal system, they think of you know, the living organisms, um, uh, we also need to think about the, what we call abiotic factors. So things that are not biology, um, and I have added in here plastics or other pollution, but there's many, um, non-biological things that are affecting our coastal zone. And we need to, um, keep that in mind as we develop a coastal zone sort of strategy. Um, of course, on the biotic side, uh, while we might think of the organisms that live there today, we also need to think of interactions between those organisms. Um, 
invasive species that may be um, uh, growing or um, expanding. Think of competition for different organisms, uh, as well as, um, yeah, so many different factors to consider on the biological side. So um, many things to think about. Um, and of course, our coastal zone is, is very important because it's the most productive parts of our oceans. This is a map, a satellite uh, image of primary production in the ocean. This is the very smallest organisms and um, their, uh, their rate of growth. And what it's showing in red is sort of uh, the highest areas at a certain time, of course, um, of, of where primary production is occurring. This is the basis for the food web. Um, and of course, you can see a lot of red in coastal areas. Um, I know, and this is very far zoomed out, but even in coastal areas um, at certain times, it's going to vary over time. So um, coastal ecosystems are also, um, they're not only important because of their, their habitat, they provide um, uh, many different services to our, um, our communities. Uh, and we like to uh, refer to this as ecosystem services is a term that you will hear often. And, and many of you are maybe are studying or concerned about those. This is a picture of a mangrove tree, but it could just as well be a picture of a, of a coral reef. Um, and it's illustrating here the different ecosystem services that that natural ecosystem provides to us. Um, of course, uh, uh, as I mentioned, there's, um, let, let's just look at the bottom. Uh, there's a lot of things on this diagram, so um, I'll let you look at this later, but um, there's many ways in which this natural habitat is um, providing a service for the people of the coast. Maybe it's in terms of fish, or maybe um, it's affecting uh, climate regulation or stabilizing the shoreline. All of these factors are things that we should be considering and recognizing the value of them. Um, because many people, if you only think of it as a habitat where people go have tourism, um, that may um, not fully value the, the benefit of this ecosystem. So, um, this is another thing that when we want to have discussions about coastal zone management, we really need to get people to get a, a full understanding of the coastal system and how it is helping people in direct and indirect ways, um, which, you know, many people are, are, are likely not familiar with. Um, and additionally, um, I want to highlight that when we think about our coastal and ocean areas, um, they are really key for our, what we call our blue economy. Uh, this is a very popular term today, um, focused on um, recognizing the economic, all the economic activities related to our oceans. Um, and we, as we, many of us want to grow the blue economy. We want to see more business and, and more prosperity for our coastal systems. But we need to do it in a sustainable way because the ocean needs to, um, and these habitats need to persist and provide for, for decades, for centuries, for the future populations to be able to enjoy. So, when we think about blue growth and blue economic issues, we really need to be thinking about how do we keep this sort of, um, you know, wealth of, of activity, sustain it for, um, this is the infinity symbol. <laughs> and how do we sustain it for infinity um, into the, you know, beyond uh, our lives and so much more. Um, and right now we have uh, an important, um, sort of period of time going on. The United Nations has declared this the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And the um, tagline is called the, the science we need for the ocean we want. And that's something that we all need to be thinking about. How do we apply science to shape, understand our coastal and ocean and apply it to manage it in the way that we would like?
Okay, hopefully uh, you're all doing okay. <laughs> um, so uh, there's some important concepts in coastal uh, or in sustainability in general. And these are some, some diagrams that demonstrate those. I think they're helpful to consider because many of us often think of maybe about the environment, um, but of course the environment's being used by our society and it's critical to our economy. So uh, we need to think about the sustainability of in our environment so we can benefit society and the economy. And this is sort of a Venn diagram to uh, illustrate that. Another um, way of visualizing that is that the environment is um, a constraint to our growth. Uh, so here's a, a series of circles. Of course, the environment is you know, where we live. It's the whole world, right? Um, or you can imagine this for wherever you are living. But um, society lives in that environment and the economy is based on it. So the economy can't grow beyond the environment, right? We need to, and if this environment and the quality of the environment is shrinking and degrading, our, our uh, economic prosperity is being going to be limited. So uh, these are important concepts to sort of share with people and to understand as we um, want to argue for coastal zone management. Uh, Professor? Uh, yes. So. Can we, uh, because like uh, to enable some participant to ask questions, so can yes. we? Yes. Yeah, okay. Stop there. Yes. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. yeah, I can pause there. I can pause. Um, does anyone have any questions? Sorry. So, Mohammed. Uh, I believe... Oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Mohammed. Yes, uh, Dr. Wallace, I have a question about the the sea level rise, you said uh, it uh, along with a history, it fluctuates, uh, and you have evidence for this. And we in Egypt, we have many evidence, like uh, oasis on the on the on the desert on the on the Sahara, have have a marine deposits and uh, and uh, many evidence of it. So it is not it's uh, the sea level rise. It is not linked. It is so linked with uh, with climate change evidence. We, we uh, uh, many scenarios, many climate change scenarios, uh, uh, re result is that the 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 impact of uh, climate change will be uh, sea level the, the the sea level will rise and will uh, will uh, many cities will locked in the waters and uh, something like this. Very, very true, Mohammed, and that is one, um, you know, great concern for our coastal areas all around the world. Um, of course, sea, sea level rise, as we as we do more and more research, it's not the same everywhere. We often talk about global sea level rise, but what's happening in a in a very specific in one location is is governed by many things. Um, actually, just this past um, week, there was a uh, a newspaper and a, a research paper that was published by by some of my colleagues at URI that that highlights that New York City is sinking under the weight of its own buildings, um, parts of New York City. So this is um, we need to consider, and and that makes sea level rise more rapid there um, than the global average. But you are absolutely right; um, it is a gigantic problem that um, many coastal areas are faced with. There is um, uh, another question in the chat. So it's really yeah. uh, a repeated question from uh, people who are like living in our uh, region in desert. So they, uh, they, mostly they were like pushed to ask, okay, um, uh, if our uh, region is more under uh, like uh, droughts and we are not so like uh, worry from storms rather than droughts. So he, he is like uh, uh, making an example for the, the Dead Sea that we have. So then how uh, this kind of coastal management could be changed in our setting in the Middle East? Yes. Yeah, thanks for, for, for asking that question. Um, and that was one of the key points that I, I was trying to get across is that the issues, every coastal area are a bit different and, um, and droughts is a, a, a great concern. Um, and uh, 
I don't want to, you know, say how we should manage. I think what is important is that um, for every place on earth, it really, you need to have science that's going to add insight and you need to have the people that can um, understand that science and can consider um, how, how they may need to manage the coast. For example, limiting water use, particularly during times of drought or um, creating uh, reserves of water or limiting groundwater extraction. There are many different um, approaches for um, drought management and I am not an expert in those. So, um, but, but that's where um, we do have to think um, about our place and uh, the specific problems of everywhere. Hopefully that made sense. Yes, so uh, if there is no question, I have a, a final question. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so in, like uh, about like involving people in the, the process of coastal management. So maybe in our states, we are like more centralized, like um, kind of like management and so. So, uh, uh, and maybe in United States, it's like maybe more difficult because like you, you have to go to each building and like ask uh, about his like <laughs> his opinion yes. and so <laughs> maybe there's like would be a, a catastrophe for like planners in Egypt if it if this is the case so we have like planners from Cairo like planning whatever we have costs uh, all over Egypt and that's very easy like from the fifth settlement exactly and so how how do you involving people in, in like USA and this like complexity of involving people. How did you how did you solve it? If you yeah, solve it, yeah. yeah. So I think again, how you engage people, um, of course, depends on the place as well. So um, and and that's where I wanted to share an example from where I live, and of course, that's very different than than where all of you are living. Um, but but I will highlight, even if you have a centralized government, um, it's still important to. Um, engage the people so that they understand the problems and buy into and sort of um, sort of support the solutions or the management that is going to be in, in place and maybe have a uh, input on how management is going to be done. Um, because, you know, if, if only uh, things come from the top down, it may not be the most effective or the most um, appreciated uh, solution. So, how you bring people together and and how that's in, I you know that's not something I can add uh, comment on for for ever, where you all live, but I do think it's nevertheless important to do um, to bring people to the conversation and to make them aware and to understand um, so that um, so you can have effective and uh, lasting uh, management. Okay. So any final words to Professor Walsh because before we close this one? So we have no, uh, Noran from FES. So Hello. Thanks. Thank Hello. you, Professor. The, the presentation was amazing. Thank you. A mm. reflection? I'm not sure. Uh, the sentence that you've said about New York uh, drowning under its own weight uh, do you mean physically that the land, because of the weight of whatever development and urban development that we're doing, is getting like um, down or uh, it's just about um, hypothetically? Because no, I, I, it, it, it gave me this image, mental image, and I'm not sure. Yeah, you're right. That That is the... Um... Uh, the image. So there's there's things, literally the weight of buildings is causing the land uh, to subside. Also, the other thing that is very common in cities is extracting water um, because we usually are taking water out of the, the underneath us, right, from those aquifers. And that can cause very significant subsidence. Places like Jakarta and many other cities of the world um, have shown this um, and we can measure it by satellite now uh, very well. So, so yeah, the, the buildings themselves can cause weight. How we, how we um, extract these many different um, forces on, on subsidence and sea level rise is, is still, you know, a science that's developing, but, but that was what the paper was about. And um, yeah, if you Google it, you will, you will be able to learn more. Okay. Thanks, Thanks a lot. A lot.
Thanks a lot all for your question and like thanks a lot, Professor Walsh, for this great presentation. Actually, it widened the prospects of uh, like the participants. So I believe it will help them a lot in their ongoing tasks. So thanks again and sorry for like make you very early in the morning, giving a little- No problem, my enough. pleasure, Ahmed. Thank you very much. Thanks. Actually, Thanks can enough. I make one uh, final comment? And yes, say, yes, please. Um, you yes, know, I'm please. very happy to share the slides and oh, yes, um, you know, there's a few more slides that talk about the definition of coastal management and some other um, ideas to consider. Um, so, you know, please, you know, look through those and if you have any questions or feel free to email me, um, uh, you know, I think it is important to have people understanding this complicated process of, of managing our coasts. Yes. Okay. So, sir, if you want. Uh, 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 no, no, I have just, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the professor and uh, we 